This rather neat looking device is from BM Home Stores in the UK and it's called a 2-in-1 solar buzzkill. I'm not sure what the 2-in-1 is. It, I mean, it's an insect zapper. I'm guessing maybe they're featuring the solar panel as a, a feature, one of those 2-in-1 features. But it has these rubber suction cups, or, well, I say rubber, plasticky... I'm not sure, can you call that rubber? It, it, it doesn't even feel like silicon as such, silicon rubber, but uh, anyway, let's just call them rubber. Rubber suction cups, and it's got this the uh, amorphous solar panel, and you stick it on your window, and it charges during the day, and then at night time, when it's turned on, uh, an ultraviolet, well, they say, you know, they actually say blue, they're quite honest about that, but it is a sort of near ultraviolet LED, as I'll show you in a moment. Now, this thing is quite interesting because the cover comes off quite easily if you align these little arrows, and it's got three positions. It's got the unlock position, it's got the off position where it's locked, but it won't come off. You can take that off for cleaning the grills, and then it's got the on position, where you have to push the button down, and then rotate it, and then it holds that button in. And when I place this down now, the near ultraviolet LED will light and the grid will be electrified. Quite spicy sparks. Now, for those of you wondering why I'm not getting a shock through an aluminium screwdriver in this instance, it's because that is a self-contained circuit. The, the potential difference is only between these wires and therefore, although it sparks across, there's no reference to ground, so I'm not getting a shock. And it's interesting to note that when you turn it off and that button pops out, it discharges almost instantly. I'm wondering if there's a, uh, that's just a very high dish. I, I wouldn't think there'd be a, a low value discharge resistor because you'd think that would make it less efficient. You'd, you'd want to keep a charge in these wires if it's solar powered with this sort of minimum of current. So um, I think we should open this. It's always a good idea, isn't it? So let's get the lid off it and see what sort of circuitry is inside and test the current. I want to see how much current actually draws when it's in sort of a uh, running mode. It shouldn't be too high because it uses, well, solar power, but it, I suppose that depends. The runtime will depend on how much sunshine it gets during the day and what sort of capacity the cell is inside. It's a triple A cell. Um, have I got a meter that can, yes, I can bring in this cheapy meter. Cheapy meter that I won't knock because they're actually very useful for stuff like this, but they've not got a huge amount of protection so against either huge electrical incidents or um, just, you know, accidental putting it. One of the biggest weaknesses with these meters is that you can, with the meter leads in the standard position for ohms and volts, you can actually select the current. And in many ways, that's very convenient. But in other ways, it means that if you accidentally turn it to the current setting when it basically shorts the output, then it can actually uh, blow the fuse inside, if there is a fuse inside. So let's put that there. Let's put on that on there. Put it 200 milliamp setting and push the button in. Oh, that's not going to that's not going to work because I need to uh, cover that solar panel. Okay, let's try and do this without getting my fingers on the high voltage circuitry. This is where it could all go horribly wrong. Initial current of 91 milliamps, going down to 30. So that's the initial charge was the high current there. And now it's gone down to about 20 milliamps quiescent current from that cell. That's not bad. That's not too bad at all, 22 milliamps. Okay, the capacity of this cell is quoted as being 600 milliamp hour, so technically speaking at that, it would run for, well, a day if it was fully charged, but it depends how much this is going to take uh, during a typical day. Let's uh, turn this meter off. Those little uh, cheapy meters are ideal as general purpose, you know, monitoring meters where you don't want to tie up your main meter. You can just use those little meters as an extra sort of bench meter. They're quite handy for that, just for monitoring uh, a couple of variables at once. Ooh, this whole thing's coming out. Ooh, all right, okay. So that looks like the main zap capacitor. That's the little step-up transformer. That looks like a standard little, um, the booster chip for the LED. It probably is. 
this circuitry here might be running independently then. Let's pop this out. Being careful. <clears throat> so what am I seeing here? I am seeing the booster circuit being used to drive the LED, presumably. But is that also... Uh, there's a two transistor circuit here, which is driving that transformer with feedback. And then... Oh, is that a resistor? Or a diode? What is that? It looks like a... Actually, it looks a bit nondescript. M7, it's a diode. I wonder if... The, this button has several contacts, and it makes me ponder whether the way that discharged so quickly, I wonder if it's got an actual discharge circuit that when the button gets released, it actually automatically discharges this. Now, this is a fairly multiple stage. It's got uh, four capacitors and four diodes, suggesting it's being used as a voltage multiplier in the output from these two pins here. And then that's charging, ultimately, that big capacitor in the back, which is rated... It's rated 400 volts, a standard capacitor here for the sort of... It's 470 nano, 400 volts, so the sort of capacitor you'd find inside a LED lamp. And that is fundamentally it. It's quite neat, actually. I'm guessing this is just... It's actually fairly complex. It's got a few capacitors there for the feedback circuit. I'm guessing that they've designed the oscillator circuit for this in conjunction with this little transformer for maximum efficiency so that, you know, after the initial current surge of it charging that capacitor up, it just runs at a very low level. Or does it turn off? I think it would keep running. It's hard to say. But, um, yeah, that's quite interesting. Power is going through the switch to that circuit. Oh, actually, you know what? Oh, no, it can't be. What's that diode for, then? Um, I'm going to have a wee uh, nose at this, I think, just to see if I can make any more sense out of this, but it is a wee bit crammed in there, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to just reverse engineer it right now. But uh, I'm going to take a look at this. I'll be back in a moment. Oh, this is some very weird circuitry. I had to do a couple of double takes in this because some of it just doesn't make sense, but I'll let you judge for yourself. The circuitry starts off fairly straightforward. We've got a YX8051, which is a standard solar sort of garden light LED driver. And it's got the solar panel going through the unit, uh, feeding back to the uh, nickel metal hydride cell. And then it's got the inductor here and the LED. So if we look at that bit, the circuitry in its own at that side, that is a standard solar garden light. But then we get the voltage step-up circuit based on the transformer and the little sort of self-feedback oscillator arrangement. And this is where it gets very, very odd because they're using the drive pulses to LED to pump up this capacitor here to actually activate, to enable that circuitry for generating the high voltage. Just basically, it's a way of using the existing... Uh, sent circuitry for the LED to actually drive the transformer at the same time. But I don't get this. There's a PNP transistor with its base. And, I, you know, I checked the pin out. Initially, I thought maybe that this resistor was going to be coming from the LED and it was going to switch this transistor so that uh, connected. Basically, it charged this capacitor up from the main rail here. But instead, and for no obvious reason I can work out, there's a resistor going down to the base of this PNP transistor and to turn it on, and it's effectively turning it on all the time. And then the output from the LED here is going via the transistor that's turned on via the diode, and then it's uh, keeping this capacitor charged up to enable this transistor here. But kind of, you'd think that surely then this transistor's kind of pointless. They could have just put a diode straight from there. Although, I suppose there's a possibility well, it's always it's going to happen regardless, isn't it? Because the transistor's on. That current could flow down through the inductor, even when that's off. Uh, and it could go through the diode and uh, charge that capacitor. But, but that's what they've done. It's a bit weird. 
The feedback circuitry also has a few quirks. It's got the main primary winding, which is switched by an NPN transistor. And that's uh, biased on slightly by this uh, resistor from that sort of uh, enabling supply there. And as soon as that starts conducting, current's coupled through this capacitor and drives that transistor on hard. But there's also this 100 nano between the collector and the base. Hmm, odd. The output goes through a, the transformer. Well, the transformer has the primary feedback and it's got the high voltage winding, which then goes through multiple stage voltage multiplier to the 470 nanofarad, 400 volt capacitor, and then to the output. And then, as I was suspecting earlier on, there is a switch that is, uh, when it's in the on position, uh, it powers the whole circuit. When it's in the off position, it shunts this out. And it's for, for safety, it's to basically discharge the output capacitor so you can't get a shock off the grill when you take the cover off. But instead of using a discharge resistor, I would have thought here they would have had a switch with a fairly high value discharge resistor, like one mega ohm. But uh, instead of that, they've got a diode, which as soon as that switch closes, it just basically shunts that capacitor through the diode with a pop, and that's going to like uh, basically cause the switch contacts to arc. I don't know why they did that. I, I don't know why they used a diode there at all instead of a resistor. Uh, given that, you know, the resistor's only switched in when the unit's turned off and only across that output, they could have used something like, they could have used a 1 kilo ohm resistor, they could have used 100k, 10k, they could have used absolutely anything just to quickly discharge that capacitor down to a safe level. But they used a diode, which just doesn't seem to make sense. So the circuitry, it's odd. Very odd. I mean, it works. I get the feeling that round about here they've just said, let's just do something that works. Because to me that could have also just been a diode or two to try and just keep this below the threshold of turning on um, until the raised voltage of this operating, this uh, higher voltage. Because normally that's going to be about 1.2 to 1.5. But when the LED is being driven, it, the voltage pulses will reach about 3 volts or so uh, at, the, for the sort of, at the peak forward current of the LED. Oh, very odd. Very odd indeed. And that just leaves one more test, and that is what voltage does this put out? Let's uh, bring the meter in. Let's stick a battery into this. Try not to zap myself in the process. Let's uh, get a meter in. I'll zoom out just a tad. And we'll bring the meter in. Is that going to be visible? I think it's... I'll tilt it up. Uh, and that just leaves connecting the leads... So I reckon that's probably going to be negative and that's going to be positive. And we'll set the meter to about, uh, well, its highest DC voltage setting, which is 600 volts DC. Then I shall, without sticking my fingers across the high voltage bit, which is pretty tricky because the high voltage bit actually comes all the way around here. Let's see if I can do this without zapping myself. Yeah, I'll just do it like this. And the voltage has gone up to 170 volts. It's not huge, but it's ample enough to do the job. Okay. So yeah, it's an interesting and odd circuit. Very, very strange indeed. Some very mysterious bits to that. But, um, but I suppose ultimately it does work. So maybe they've just, you know, juggled components until it worked. And that is a very odd thing there. But yeah, it's interesting.